Let's do this. You shall not pass. Sir, I'm here for the Warlock tryouts. I, I want to find a patron so I can gain some cool magical powers. You shall not pass. This guy's kind of a dick. Sir, to be honest with you, I... I kind of failed my test to become a paladin. I slipped up on the oath a little bit. <laughs> Trust me, you should see some of the wackos they let into that club. <laughs> Anyways, I just want to get revenge and destroy all things good in the world. You shall not leave here without awesome magical powers. Come on in. Wait, what? Oh, hell yeah! Welcome back for another class guide video. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a class that gains their horrifying and deadly magic from a pact made with mysterious beings of supernatural power. You guessed it, the Warlock. If you like demons and devils, fey beings and alien-like creatures, and you're crazy enough to want to do business with them, the Warlock might be the class for you. We're going to talk about the Warlock's class features, what races go well with the Warlock, the Warlock's pact magic and spells, and of course some of the subclasses, three of which are highly likely to be in the game. If you truly want to understand this class, you have to stick around for the entire video, for this class does differ greatly from the other spellcasting classes. And as always guys, keep in mind we haven't seen the Warlock in Baldur's Gate 3, yet so some things are subject to change but this video should serve as a good foundation for understanding what this class is all about if you guys enjoyed this video please subscribe there'll be much more Baldur's Gate 3 content on the way I've already done 40 plus videos up to this point as well as many other class guides links to my Twitter and my discord server will be below let's talk warlocks <laughs> Warlocks are driven by an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and power, which compels them into the packs that ultimately shape their lives. Whether that pact is with fiends such as archdevils and demons, or if it's with the wild and trickster fey lords, or maybe even with alien beings far from the material world, whichever path you take, these patrons will provide the means for you to gain magical powers, subtle and extraordinary. Warlocks spend their days in active pursuit of their goals, using these powers to aid themselves, but they also might have to follow the demands of their patron at times. The story of how your warlock came into their power can vary from player to player. Did your patron find you, or did you find them? Maybe you were seduced into summoning a devil, or maybe through research and extreme curiosity, you sought out the ritual that would let you make contact with an alien elder god. The story of your warlock is often a great tale to be told, and it should be a powerful and fun class in Baldur's Gate 3. So what role does a warlock typically play in an adventuring party? Well, let's first point out that charisma is the spellcasting ability for your warlock, so having a high charisma naturally makes you a great social character. So you can be this mysterious, dark magic wielding, but highly charismatic character and really excel in dialogue situations. It's an interesting combination. In terms of combat, warlocks can be great ranged magic damage dealers. They are very different from the other spellcasters, and they can also be great in closer melee situations. You might even find yourself mixing physical combat with magic, and it can be a deadly combination. Overall, the warlock can be extremely versatile depending on your choices, and you can do many things to prove your worth to your party. Now let's talk about what ability scores you might want to focus on, and then we can get into what racial choices go well with the warlock. Just like the other spellcasters, your primary ability score focus will be on your spellcasting ability, which is Charisma for the Warlock. Having a high Charisma will help you with your spell attack modifier and your spell save DC. Having a high Charisma will also help with those social situations that you'll find yourself in. Constitution is a common second choice to focus on, for not only does it help you with your HP, it also helps your Warlock hold their concentration for spells that require concentration, which will likely be many of your spells. Dexterity is also usually one of the top three, for many Warlocks wear light armor, and Dexterity will help you with your armor class to keep you alive and well. Wisdom and Intelligence is a personal choice, depending on what you value more, and Strength is usually your dump stat. 
Half Elf is a great choice for basically all classes that deal with the Charisma ability score. As a Half Elf, you'll gain a plus two to Charisma, and two other ability scores of your choice will increase by one. That sets you up for success right away at level one. You also gain Dark Vision as a Half Elf, and some other nice racial features such as skill versatility, which gives you proficiency in two skills. Tieflings are a great choice, and not only for it making sense from a lore standpoint, but Tieflings also get a plus two to Charisma charisma, and they get a plus one to intelligence. Tieflings also get some nice racial features like dark vision and hellish resistance which gives you resistance to fire damage. From the gameplay it seems like we'll be getting more than one subrace choice for the tiefling, so keep that in mind when officially making your character. Drow can be a great choice for they get a plus one to charisma and a plus two to dexterity, and let's face it, it's kinda badass to be a drow warlock. If the game has the variant human, you can't go wrong with that as well. Keep in mind that we don't know all of the races that will be in the game yet, you don't have to choose one of the races that I just mentioned. Now let's talk about the Warlock's general class features such as hit points and proficiencies, and then we'll talk about the fun stuff like choosing a patron in the Warlock's Pact Magic. As a warlock, you'll have a hit dice of 1d8, a little on the lower side, so having a decent constitution can really help here. You'll start off at level 1 with the max of 8 HP, and from there on out, every level that you gain, you'll either roll an 8-sided die and add the result to your current HP, or you might use the fixed rate HP increase of 5 per level. Don't forget that your constitution modifier is added each level as well to your HP. You'll be proficient in light armor, and for weapons you'll be proficient in all simple weapons, which are weapons that can be commonly found in the hands of commoners, such as clubs, maces, and daggers. For saving throws, you'll have proficiency in wisdom, which will help your warlock resist effects that charm, frighten, or otherwise assault your willpower. And you'll also have proficiency in charisma saving throws, which can help with things such as resisting being banished. For skills, you'll choose two from Arcana, Deception, History, Intimidation, Investigation, Nature, and Religion. And if you choose the Half Elf, you'll have two more skill proficiencies as well, which can be very helpful. Now on to the fun and interesting stuff that we get to delve right into at class level 1. I'm only going to talk about the subclasses that are in the player's handbook for now, for those have been confirmed. Other D&D books have been mentioned, but we're not really sure yet, I'll save that for a later video. If we take a look at the Warlocks class chart here, excluding levels 11 to 20 for max level and Baldur's Gate 3 will be 10, you can see that right away at class level 1, we get to choose an otherworldly patron, which is your subclass choice. This is a big decision right away at the start of the game, and it will affect your entire playthrough. Let's go over them. If you choose the Archfey, your patron is a lord or lady of the Fey, a creature of legend who holds secrets that were forgotten before the mortal races were born. The Fey are tricksters and will allow you to gain magical powers of illusion and mind control. Choosing the Archfey as well as the other patron choices will give you a special patron expanded list of spells to choose from when you get to learn a new warlock spell. These are spells that are not traditionally on the warlock spell list, but when you choose your patron they are added to the warlock spell list. Here's the chart showing the Archfey specific spells corresponding to their spell level. Many of these are great spells, such as Fairy Fire, Sleep, Dominate Person, and Greater Invisibility. If I were to go over them all, we would be here all day, you should be able to get an idea as to what some of them are by their names. Also, if you choose the Archfey, you'll gain patron-specific features at class levels 1, 6, and 10. At level 1, you'll get Fey Presence, which lets you project the fearsome presence of the Fey, forcing creatures around you to do saving throws to try and avoid being charmed or frightened. At class level 6, you gain Misty Escape, which allows you to vanish in a puff of mist in response to harm. Basically, this is a reaction, not an action, and when you take damage, you will turn invisible and teleport away. At max level 10, you will gain Beguiling Defenses, which is where your patron teaches you how to turn the mind-affecting magic of your enemies against them. This will make you immune to being charmed, and when another creature attempts to charm you, you can use your reaction to turn the charm back on them. The Fiend is the classic Warlock patron that you probably would think of. You have made a pact with a Fiend from the lower planes of existence, a being whose aims are evil, even if you strive against those aims. 
arch devils such as the famous and feared Asmodeus, demon lords, mighty pit fiends, balors, ultraloss, all fit into this category. This is a great patron type to choose if you're into making a bad deal for your soul with your favorite evil lord. Here is the fiend's expanded spell list that you'll have access to. Most of these spells are damage fire based and make sense. Fireball, Flame Strike, Wall of Fire, all great spells. Choosing the Fiend subclass will give you special features at class levels 1, 6, and 10. At level 1, you gain Dark One's Blessing, which allows you to gain temporary hit points when you reduce a hostile creature to 0 hit points. At level 6, you get Dark One's Own Luck, which lets you call on your patron to alter fate in your favor by letting you add a d10 to an ability check or saving throw. You can do this after seeing the result of the initial roll. And at max level 10, you gain Fiendish Resilience, which lets you choose one damage type to gain resistance to when you finish a short or long rest. You gain resistance to that damage type until you choose a different one. All great features to have. Perhaps the most interesting patron choice of them all is the Great Old One. Your patron is a mysterious entity whose nature is utterly foreign to the fabric of reality. This could be from the far realm, the space beyond reality, or it could be one of the elder gods known only in legend. This patron has immense ancient knowledge and its motives are incomprehensible to mortals. It's definitely a possibility that the Great Old One might not even be aware of your existence, but you have somehow learned how to draw your magic from it. This patron choice might be a great choice for Baldur's Gate 3, for it deals a lot with psychic stuff, which is exactly what the Mind Flayers will be attempting to do to your party. Here's the Great Old One expanded spell list, which includes some great spells such as Dissonant Whispers, Evard's Black Tentacles, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, and Dominate Person. As you can see, the expanded spell lists really seem to fit the type of patron that you choose. Like the other patrons, you also gain patron-specific class features at levels 1, 6, and 10. At class level 1, you get Awakened Mind, which is where your alien knowledge gives you the ability to touch the minds of other creatures, which is in basic terms, telepathy. This will be very interesting when coming across Mind Flayers, for they also have telepathy. At class level 6, you gain Entropic Ward, which lets you magically ward yourself against an attack and to turn an enemy's fouled strike into good luck for yourself. Basically, for this feature, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on an enemy's attack roll, and if they miss their strike, your next attack roll against the creature will have advantage if you make it before the end of your next turn. A cool and helpful feature. At max level 10, you'll get Thought Shield, which makes it so your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You also have resistance to psychic damage, and whenever a creature deals psychic damage to you, that creature takes the same amount of damage that you do. So those are the three subclasses that are in the player's handbook. Now let's talk about a Warlock's Pact Magic, which is their unique way of doing spellcasting. If we take a look at the Warlock's class chart, you can see that right away at level 1, you gain Pact Magic. On the right side of the chart, you see that there's a Cantrips Known column, and at Warlock level 1, you will know 2 Cantrips, and at max level 10, you will know 4. Cantrips are spells that you will learn and be able to cast at will without the use of spell slots. Eldritch Blast is the classic most popular cantrip to have, and what it does is shoot a beam of crackling energy towards a creature, dealing force damage. As you level up, you'll gain more beams, probably two in Baldur's Gate 3, and you can shoot those at two different targets or focus them both on one. This can be an amazing damage dealing cantrip, especially when you combo it with certain Eldritch invocations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Next to the cantrips known column, we have spells known. These are the spells that you'll be choosing from the Warlock spell list, which will include your subclass specific spells as well. At class level 1, you'll be able to choose 2 spells to learn, and by the time you reach level 10, you'll have a total of 10 spells known. To the right of that, you see spell slots and slot level, which tells us how many spell slots we'll have available and what level those spell slots will be. For example, at level 1, you'll know 2 warlock spells, but only have 1 spell slot. Therefore, you can only cast 1 warlock spell before needing a short or long rest to regain back the missing spell slot. Let me remind you that the 2 cantrips that you know at level 1 will always be available. The first thing you may notice is that the Warlock doesn't have very many spell slots. You only get one at level 1, and then you will have two spell slots for the rest of your playthrough to level 10. 
It sounds pretty underpowered initially, but the catch here is that even though you have a limited amount of spell slots, they are of the same level and they level up with you. So by class level 9, both of your spell slots will be level 5 slots. So you can cast two level 5 spells, which will likely be the highest level of spell in the game for any class, or you can cast lower level spells using a level 5 spell slot, making them more powerful. Also, a warlock regains their spell slots after a short rest, while most other classes need a long rest to gain back their spell slots. Short rests will be in Baldur's Gate 3. We have not actually seen a party do it, but we have seen the option. This basically means that you could have your spell slots back for many, many combat encounters, for all you have to do is take a short rest and then you're back in action. Here's a quick look at the Warlock spell list, excluding the subclass specific spells. Feel free to pause if you would like to read the spell names and look them up, but I will talk about a few of them right now. Cantrips are at the top, and we already talked about Eldritch Blast, which is an amazing cantrip. Hex is a great level 1 Warlock spell that places a curse on a creature dealing extra necrotic damage whenever you hit it with an attack, and it also gives the target disadvantage on ability checks for an ability that you choose. Hex is a bonus action and requires you to hold concentration. It can be a great spell to combo with other spells to get additional damage. Hunger of Hadar is a great control and damage spell where you open a gateway to the dark between the stars, a region infested with unknown horrors. This will create a sphere of blackness with whispers and horrifying noises. Any creature that starts their turn in this area takes 2d6 cold damage, and any creature that ends their turn in this area takes 2d6 acid damage. Creatures in the sphere will be blinded and will be considered as on difficult terrain. Banishment can be a great spell that banishes a creature to a different plane. And Hellish Rebuke is a reaction spell that when you're damaged by a creature within 60 feet of you, your enemy will be surrounded by hellish flames dealing fire damage. And there are many more useful spells, including some more utility spells to choose from as well. There may be some good summoning spells as well, depending on if Larian puts spells from other D&D books in the game, such as Summon Greater Demon, which does as you would expect. So now we've talked about your ability scores, your racial choices, what patron you might want to go with, your packed magic and spells, and now let's talk about the remaining class features that you'll gain on your journey to level 10. At class level 2, you'll get a very important class feature called Eldritch Invocations. If you notice on the far right of the chart, there is an Invocations Known column. Eldritch Invocations can affect how you cast some spells, as well as provide other benefits. Some have prerequisites that need to be met in order to be allowed to learn an invocation, but others don't have any prerequisites at all. At class level 2, you'll be able to get 2 Eldritch Invocations, and at max level 10, you will have 5. There are a lot to choose from, and I'm assuming there will be a good amount in Baldur's Gate 3 as well. Let's talk about a few of them so you can get an idea as to what they do. Agonizing Blast is a very good invocation for it vastly improves the damage of your Eldritch Blast cantrip, which we talked about earlier. You now get to add your Charisma modifier to the damage it deals on a hit. Repelling Blast makes your Eldritch Blast cantrip now push a creature up to 10 feet away from you. And yes, you can have both Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast at the same time, making your Eldritch Blast cantrip super powerful. There will also likely be even more invocations that deal with your Eldritch Blast. This is why it's such a great cantrip to choose. Eldritch Invocations don't only deal with the Eldritch Blast cantrip though, there are many other choices such as ones that give you more skill proficiencies, or ones that allow you to see in magical darkness, and ones that let you use certain spells without having to use a spell slot up. If you plan out your Warlock build, you can really make some nice combinations with your invocations. Any D&D Warlock experts, feel free to let us know your favorite invocations in the comments below. Heading back to the class chart, at class level 3 we get a Pact Boon. This is where your otherworldly patron bestows a gift upon you for your loyal service. You will gain one of the following features of your choice. Pact of the Chain will let you learn the Find Familiar spell, which summons a creature to your side, and you'll have an expanded list of choices of creatures to summon as a warlock, such as imps and pseudo-dragons. This is a cool and powerful spell. These companions can help in combat, they can scout ahead, maybe even deliver messages, and more. 
Pact of the Blade allows you to use your action to create a packed weapon in your empty hand. You will be proficient in this weapon and you can choose the form that this melee weapon takes. It will count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistances and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. If you choose the Pact of the Tome, your patron will give you a grimoire called the Book of Shadows. When you gain this feature, you will choose three cantrips from any class's spell list, and while the book is on your character, you can cast these cantrips at will. There's so much to talk about. The Warlock is truly a unique and fairly complex class. I wish I could go over more, but I'll be here for days editing this video. On the rest of your journey to level 10, you will of course get ability score improvements at class levels 4 and 8, or you can choose a feat instead of the ability score improvement. If I left anything important out, or if you want to share your experience with the Warlock class, put it in the comments below. It's always great to hear other people's experiences. Thanks so much for watching guys. If you guys enjoyed the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. It's a huge help to my videos. I do all sorts of videos on this channel ranging from comedy videos to live streams to game reviews to game tutorials. And I've already done a ton of class guides. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy the other classes as well. I look forward to seeing some of you guys on a future video. Until next time.